Okay, so I was looking at this um, this picture here, this little cartoon. The machine doesn't work. How can that? I wait, wait. Of course, what a fool I am. And this made me think of my recent bout of troubleshooting with the 1510 rig here in the Dominican Republic. I thought you guys would appreciate this. This is the rig. This is the Dominican Republic. It's kind of a rainy day today. And I want to tell you a little bit about what happened when I went to work with this thing, on this thing, here in the DR. So everything was going fine. I was making all kinds of contacts. I have, let me get the breakfast cereal bowl out of the way. <laughs> uh, I have a uh, little amplifier, an AN762 from Communications Electronics. <clears throat> I have a little box with... Um, LPAT, low pass filters from a 10 tech Delta that Pete recommended that I buy. And then I got up because I don't build any power supplies. I got this little, uh, Samlex, uh, power supply that, uh, that, that feeds the, the amplifier that takes me up to about 1.1.1 kW. But anyway, here's the rig. There's my trusty D104. And everything was going fine, but then I noticed that occasionally when I'd be on the air with this thing, on receive, all of a sudden it would seem to go break into oscillations and it would start a low-level howl, like... I could hear the other station, but obviously there was something wrong. Also, on transmit during this time, I started getting disturbing reports from other radio amateurs that my... Audio sounded a little bit weird. One of them said it sounded a bit watery. Of course, at, at first I, I took offense at this and <laughs> attributed it to a lack of understanding of homebrew gear. I mean, it doesn't sound like an ICOM 7300. It's in a wooden box, for God's sake. But I think I started to think maybe there's something to it. So my first thought on the receive side was that this was the result of some failing in this very simple stage here. You'll recognize the, the transformer here. There's three common emitter amplifiers in here. This is the audio stage from one of the Thomas Jefferson High School direct conversion receivers. Now I've kind of, you can see I've worked on it. I've beefed up the, uh, the decoupling, the electrolytics, the emitter, de, the, the emitter uh, capacitors have been beefed up to about 470 microfarads. But I was, in the beginning, convinced, without thinking about it too much, that it must have something to do with this audio stage. That maybe this thing was oscillating. Maybe the output was getting back to the input. Maybe this uh, pot cable here was insufficiently stable. And so I spent a lot of time, a lot of um, troubleshooting time, chasing... <laughs> ghosts in the audio frequency amplifier. For a while, I thought that maybe it was just proximity to this speaker, this big speaker that I have here. Maybe there was a coupling going between uh, the output of the audio amplifier and the input here to the carrier oscillator BFO. I had an SBL1 mixer here, and it would all just go around like that. And again, I was thinking it must be some sort of combination. To isolate things a little bit, I broke the connection from the TIA amplifier into the mixer, and I also broke the connection from the mixer into the audio amplifier. And really, I guess the, uh, the, uh, the solution came when I had the scope probe on the output of the carrier oscillator. And I noticed on the, when I was looking at it that when I heard the whooping sound, this is when I still had the, uh, the audio amplifier connected, of course. When I heard the whooping sound, the uh, the signal from the carrier oscillator started looking really weird. It started looking really like, uh, I don't know, get how to, how to describe it. It just looked kind of flaky. Um, so that made me focus on the, the carrier oscillator. I realized what I had done there, a couple things I had... Um, kind of taken the, uh, the, 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 uh, the circuit out of the bit X20, out of Farhan's bit X20, and I had just sort of reproduced it here. And then I had noticed that I wasn't getting enough 
drive to turn the diodes on. So I just sort of slap dashed another, another stage of amplification in there and I did a very, very poor job designing it. And again, it was my problem of uh, getting the design build sequence in the proper order. I was building and then <laughs> designing and not doing that much design and just hoping that it would sort of work. And it, it, it sort of worked sometimes, but it was producing this strange signal here in addition to the 24.9947 uh, signal that I needed. It was also producing a lot of other signals in there too, and that was resulting in the, the whooping sound that I heard. So anyway, what I did is I, I, I struggled with this for a while, and then I finally decided, okay, look, it's time to, to do something different. And that is, I just pulled the, uh, the whole board off, and I started from scratch. And I started with the, uh, the oscillator circuit, checked it out, saw the output was okay. Then there's a second transistor in here that is the, um, it's basic, oops, sorry, it's, it's basically an emitter follower, and it's actually a buffer between this crystal oscillator and the rest of the, uh, the circuit, and that was okay. And then the third stage is uh, an amplifier, an RC coupled amplifier that goes between the emitter follower and the actual mixer. I had an SBL1 in there, but I was very kind of uncomfortable with the SBL1. And I wanted to go with the uh, with Farhan's and Lou McCoy's, I mean, and uh, Doug DeMaw's, uh, you know, two diode, tri-filler, transformer uh, mixer, which seemed more in keeping with the completely homebrew ethos of this particular transceiver. So out came the SBL1, and for the mixer stage, I put in two two diodes, the trifiler uh, transformer, and uh, hooked it up. And at first, it seemed that everything was fine. It looked like Bob was my uncle. It looked like I had licked the problem. The whooping sound disappeared, but there was something odd about it. It just didn't seem to be balancing out the carrier as much as it should. So we had some guests here, and I was going to show them the shack. So this required me to do some cleanup around the shack. And I was taking, you know, I'm, I'm in the Dominican Republic, so access to parts is a bit more difficult. So I'm reluctant to throw anything away. So I had a box where I was throwing parts that were on the bench into the box and in the, with the idea that sometime in the future I'd be able to use them. And I noticed in there a very important capacitor. Let me see if I can get it in here. I don't know. I don't know if we can see it. Yeah, there it is right there. It's that one right there. It goes from the audio output to ground, and it is a 0 0.001 microfarad capacitor. This capacitor is important because what it does is it makes that audio port look like a ground to RF because the RF will go right through it, right to ground. But it makes that audio port also look like a high impedance to ground for audio signals, audio signals that are coming in and going out. So it's, it's essential that that cap, which I had kind of just cast aside, <laughs> be there if this uh, two diode mixer, singly balanced mixer, is to perform properly. Once I put that back in, then things started working better. So then I then I was able to use this little pot that you can see here, right up here, little pot that I have. Where is it? Where's my pointer? Hold on a second, there it is. Right there, that pot, I'm able to just adjust that and make sure that the carrier gets balanced out. Now another problem arose with this um, rather complicated looking transceiver and that I, I noticed this, I noticed that I was starting to get, I was getting a lot more power out on 15 meters than I was on 10. And my good friend Dean had done a lot of work on, this is the RF amplifier chain here, and it's basically the same RF amplifier chain that exists in the, um, in the BIDX 40 module, with the exception of the final. Farhan has an IRF 510 there. Dean and I have been using RD06 FETs, in, the, in place of it. 
So you have like two controls that you have to adjust. Um, this pot here sets the bias and this pot here sets the amount of RF that you're feeding through to the final, to the driver on the final. And no matter what I did, I noticed that the, um, um, the power output on 10 meters was very significantly reduced as opposed to 15 meters. On 15 meters, I was getting easily getting 100 watts out of this and the, the amplifier. So I, 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 just, I was just taking a look at the output from the amplifier over there. It was about 100 watts. And the output from the, on 10 meters was way down. It was down 20 watts or something like that. So something was wrong. And I started wondering, it, the problem might be in the amplifier chain, but it might be elsewhere in the rig. Now look back here. Back on the back porch, you'll see I have two bandpass filters, one for 10 and one for 15. They're both very different circuits. One is basically an upper sideband uh, filter. The other is a lower sideband filter. This is because on the two bands, with a band switching rig like this, you're supposed to be able to um, uh, knock down one of, the, one of the unwanted sidebands and not the other. And I began to... I said, okay, look, let me, let me test at the input of this amplifier here, and then just throw the switch and go between 10 and 15 on a dummy load, of course, and then just see if there's a significant change in input to the final amplifier. And lo and behold, there was. Now, fortunately, you'll see here in the 10 meter um, bandpass filter that I have trimmer pots. So again, I put the rig on, on, uh, on 10 meters and Watching the output, I went back and just tweaked these pots a bit, and I was able to get the output, um, which was the output from this bandpass filter, which is the input to this uh, amplifier chain, closer to what I was getting on 15 meters. 15 meters was still a little bit better, but I was able to get something like, like 60 or 70 watts out, maybe 80 watts, I think it was, 80 watts out on 10 and, and uh, 100 watts out on 15 which is close enough <laughs> so that you don't even really worry about the difference. But um, it's been kind of fun. I've been enjoying that. Let me, uh, let me go back to here to the rig and sit down. Um, I've, got the, uh, I've got this dial on the front of the rig, and the reason I've got it there is because, well, it's kind of cool. It's kind of, kind of cool-looking thing, I think. I kind of like it. Um, and it was given to me by a Dominican radio amateur uh, many years ago, Pericle, HI8P. Yeah, he gave it to me and it's been bouncing around my junk box all these years, 30 years or more. And so it just seemed appropriate as I was getting ready to bring this rig down here that I put this thing on there and it works fine. I'm able to get, this is the band switch down here. This little switch you see down here. This goes from the down position is 15, the up position is 10. Got the mic amp in here, a little hole for the speaker. I made up this little chart that allows me to figure out where I am on the band here. If I'm on 10, I'm using these numbers here. For example, if I'm at 99, you'll, you can see 99 corresponds to 28,360. So I know that there I'm roughly 28,360. It's, it's far from, from very, very accurate, but it gets me at the ballpark. So if I see on one of the spotter networks that, that there's DX say at uh, 28,340, I know, I look over here at the chart, 28,340, I know I should set this to about 74, and usually he's, with the DX is right around there. So that's that's the way I do it. I've got a sec second chart here for 15. I'll, I'll clean this up eventually, but I kind of like the, the simple way of, of doing it here. Uh, on, and again, this rig was supposed to be all uh, hard, hardware defined all discrete components and I've managed to do that. I, I was kind of uncomfortable with the SBL1 because it's not really a, a digital chip or anything like that, but it's 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 kind of a mystery box and you don't really know what's going on inside there as much as you you could. Whereas with the two diode singly balanced mixer, it it's uh it's really all uh very, very understandable and you can play around with the circuits and make it work a little bit better. And and then when it doesn't work properly, you can ask yourself this question. The machine doesn't work. How can that, wait, of course, 
What a fool I am. I forgot to put in the 0.001 microfarad capacitor from the audio terminal to ground. Ah! 7-3 from the Dominican Republic. This is HI7 stroke N2 CQR. 7-3.